An abnormal ear is conspicuous, and an absent one is a major cephalic deformity. The intricate and delicate anatomy of the external ear makes reconstruction a daunting task for beginning as well as experienced surgeons. Auricular topography is in part defined by the complex underlying cartilaginous skeleton. This skeleton is characterized by multiple named concavities and convexities, which are somewhat unique in people, whether or not ear pathology is present. In the sixth week of development, six small mounds called the helix of Hess form on the dorsal surface of the first and second branchial arches. These mounds will go on to form the external ear. At approximately week 8 of gestation, the groove between the first and second branchial arches that term the first branchial groove invaginates, creating the external lutromiadus. It is this invagination that allows for the simultaneous migration and fusion of the sex helix of Hess, forming the early cartilaginous precursor to the auricle. Evidence suggests that the first hillock originates from the first branchial arch and gives rise to the trigus, while the origin of the remaining hillocks remain debated. At 12 weeks of gestation, the auricle's topographical characteristics begin to develop, and at 18 weeks, the auricle detaches from the head. However, by 22 weeks, the auricle resembles that of an adult and development is complete. Some important anthropometric characteristics of the normal ear to remember. Height of the normal ear is approximately 5.5 to 6.5 centimeters. The width is around 3 to 4.5 centimeters, or about 50 to 60 percent of the auricular height. The root of the helix lies approximately one ear length lateral to the lateral orbital rim. Projection from the plane of mastoid process is approximately 20 degrees in female and 25 degrees in male. The auricle's long axis is rotated by 20 degrees posteriorly from a perfect vertical. A thorough understanding of the sizes and proportions of the normal external ear is critical for a reconstructive surgeon. 
With respect to size, the normal adult year measures about 5.5 to 6.5 centimeters in height, with a width of about 50 to 60 percent of that. A long line connecting the brow and the columnar, approximately one ear length, separates the lateral orbital rim from the root of the helix. The orgel has been noted to grow more rapidly in width than in length, with 90% of adult ear widths being reached in the first year of life, and 75% of adult ear lengths in the same time period. Ear projection, as measured by the angle between the mastoid and concha, is approximately 20 degrees in females and 25 degrees in males. Furthermore, on frontal view, the helix should project 2 to 5 millimeters more lateral than the anti-helix. With respect to ear rotation, the long axis of the auricle is normally rotated posteriorly approximately 20 degrees from the vertical. There are various anatomical variations of the ear. The variation may be inside, macrotia, microtia, anotia, or variation in position, low set ears, posterior angulation of the ear. Variation of the individual anatomical parts, including the antihelix, antitragus, concha, helix, lobe, scatha, tragus, triangular fossa, and some named ear anomalies. Microtia can be defined as a congenital anomaly of the external ear that can present with various degrees of severity, from mild structural abnormalities to the complete absence of the external and middle ear. The word microtia comes from the Latin words micro and otia, meaning little ear. Thus, microtia means congenitally small auricle with or without structural abnormalities. Microtia not only has a wide range of phenotypic expressions, but can also be associated with various craniofacial abnormalities. These defects include mandibular hypoplasia, facial nerve weakness or paralysis, soft tissue hypoplasia, palatal dysfunction, and macrostomia. These associated findings almost always occur on the same side as the microtia. Microtia may also be seen as part of various syndromes, such as Trichard Collins and Golden Heart syndromes. In the great majority of cases, microtia is also associated with an ipsilateral conductive hearing loss, secondary to either oral atresia or oral stenosis. You have to keep in mind that the ipsilateral cochlea is typically normal as it's unrelated embryologically to the development of the outer ear and canal. The prevalence of microtia varies depending on the population study. Reported rates vary widely between 0.8 and 12 per 10,000 patients in the literature. Microtia is more common in males, with an estimated increase in the risk of approximately 20 to 40 percent compared with females. Microtia tends to be more severe and is more commonly bilateral in syndromic patients. A discussion on the prevalence of microtia must include consideration of ethnicity, as significantly higher rates have been identified in Asian and Hispanic populations compared with Caucasian and African populations.
Congenital oral atresia is present in 80 to 90 percent of the cases of microtia. The severity of the deformity of the external and middle ear is generally proportionate to one another. About 80 to 90 percent of these patients have only conductive hearing loss. But 10 to 15 percent of patients can have a sensory neural hearing loss. A notable exception to this statistic is when patients have congenital oral atresia in the presence of facial nerve palsy, particularly in the setting of craniofacial microstoma, because of much higher incidence of sensory neural hearing loss in this population. Microtia can cause psychological morbidity and surgical repair results in significant relief. Environmental and genetic factors are important in the etiology of microtia. However, multiple other syndromes or genetic causes have been identified and are associated with microtia in less than 50% of cases. Ear anomalies can commonly be associated with mandibular hypoplasia, which will prompt an airway evaluation, especially in the presence of feeding or breathing difficulties. Other issues that are related to soft tissues are macrostomia and facial nerve paralysis.